thank you everyone for uh, listening in on this, what is in London at least, an extremely warm, uh, sunny day. And uh, I'll, I'll hope to use your time well and share some of my passion um, on nature-inspired engineering and first describe what that is, what is really nature-inspired engineering, why are we working on this, and why do I believe it can be valuable to design more performance multifunctional materials. And so that's at the CNIE that we do much of this work uh, at, um, at UCL, the Center for Nature-Inspired Engineering, which is funded by Frontier Engineering Grant from EPSRC. So where are we coming from here? The fact is that, as you know, there are many really large challenges and they can be framed in various ways. One, the key one is sustainability, right? And so by the United Nations, this has been formulated in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, related to poverty, education, a social context, um, uh, as well as uh, an economical context. Now, that economical context is clearly, is very clear also in the UK's industrial strategy. It's another way of formulating grand challenges. And but there too, you see, say, clean growth, which also has an environmental uh, context to it but clearly one of maximizing advantages for UK industry, future of mobility, aging, AI, data economy. So they tie into the same problems, but formulate them in a different way. And then a few years ago, in 2013, um, same date that Shidal just mentioned, there was a big meeting between three academies at the Royal Academy of Engineering, Academy of Engineering, but together with the US National Academy and the Chinese Academy of Engineering. And it was a new meeting in 2019, and it was all about what are these grand challenges? Uh, we know what the problems are, but how do we solve them? And some of the takeaways there is that we really need to think differently. We need to think outside of the box. Clearly, we need to collaborate to implement some of these really grand challenges. Think differently. Understanding also the context to be effective. The context is different uh, if you want to implement something in, 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 for example, in Africa or in the UK or in China, these things are very different and, uh, um, and, and one must, uh, must understand that. There's also something about innovation, but doing it in a responsible way. And uh, at the same time, to be able to take risk and to kind of induce people who want to uh, innovate by, um, by taking bold moves, but also to be responsible in doing it and thinking about repercussions. So overall, we call this at uh, UCL, it's one of the grand challenges that I'm actually leading, together with a colleague in STS, in the Science Technology Studies, we call this transformative technology, right? It's looking also at how innovation and technology can work together to find benefits for society and the planet. But again, I'm coming back to the general question of how do we do this? How do we solve these problems? Nashita said, I'm a chemical engineer by training. And so when we look at chemical plants, we see images like these. You see the image on the right there of some vessels in series, and they may have stirs in them. And so this is what we call the modern chemical process industry. But it's quite interesting and amusing when we put this side by side with an image of one of the oldest books on uh, metallurgy and engineering, which is uh, De Re Medallica from Agricola, 16th century. And we see also vessels in series uh, with, stir, uh, with stirs. They are made out of different materials here in wood, and, and so, of course, there has been a lot of progress in the way we design these type of reactors, but we can ask ourselves, is our point of view, our way of looking at these problems, has that really changed? What is really fundamentally changed? And so this is one of these ways of doing it. This is a concept that's called process intensification, right? And of trying to link different processes at different scales with each other to make things more compact, sustainable, safe, etc. But what the angle I'm taking to this type of problem is to say, can we perhaps innovate by drawing lessons from nature? That's what I call nature-inspired engineering. I'll try to give some examples, but before doing this, explain not just the philosophy behind nature-inspired engineering, but also what I really mean with this and how it should be turned into a methodology for design and innovation. So a method, right? The answer is question of the how. And so we can get inspiration everywhere. And when we're in lockdown, as we were here, um, and I, I, I'm lucky to have a garden, I can get inspiration from the garden. And this was a picture I took of our walnut tree uh, in the middle of March. And you see these, these structures at multiple scales, the branching architecture, which is actually a fractal, of similar architecture, multiple scales, up to the scale of where the leaves will start to bud and the flowers are there. And as I'll show, we can get inspiration from this uh, to design new types of catalysts, new types of functional materials, uh, new types of fluid distribution devices you see here, new types of flow plates for, um, for, for fuel cells, and so forth. 
And so the, um, what it is, is that when you look at nature, you can look with various eyes at nature. And one thing is clear that there's an underlying architecture, architecture, structure, but also a dynamics in natural systems with associated properties that are desirable and that are necessary for nature and for life. One is that you have a scalable architecture, which goes from the way that DNA is folded within the nucleus of a cell, the structure from molecules to these cells, to organs, to entire organisms and systems of organisms. And so when you go from the smallest scale, nanoscale to the macroscopic scales, there is in nature this optimization of transport across these scales, which is together with that process intensification. So that when you have molecular processes and that happen with chemical reactions at the molecular scale, or you have nanoscale properties of transport, that they are linked to this intrinsic scaling at multiple scales all the way to the organism that is growing as well, right? When the organism matures. And so this is really important that these properties are preserved over multiple scales. Now, another one is that processes in nature often occur far from equilibrium. In fact, equilibrium itself is death. Nothing is changing anymore. And the collective dynamics are key. So we see, for example, that when we breathe in and out and our neurons are firing and the blood is, is pulsing and our, our heart is beating, these are all collective systems, non-equilibrium processes. We see it even in the way that you have metabolic networks and genetic networks that are key indeed to drive a life. And you see it also when you look at this picture of these bacteria on a petri dish, that you have collective dynamics. In fact, when there's not enough food, the different bacteria will form communities that avoid each other so that they can make best uh, use of the environment to survive as a whole. So it is, this leads to principles, to principles of robustness, resilience, and adaptability. And I've underlined a few of these words because clearly in engineering and in society, these are equally important. These are the type of targets we're seeking resilience, adaptability, scalability, optimization of transport. And so again, there's so much to learn from nature. And the question will be to look at these underpinning principles. And that's what is key in what I call nice or nature-inspired chemical engineering, which is to learn from the architecture and dynamics of natural systems at all scales to help design and synthesize innovative, superior solutions to technological challenges. And these can be related to resource efficiency, Things of our grand challenge, the energy, water, materials, but also to problems in health. Think of our current crisis or therapeutics, to scalable manufacturing, but also in living environments, creating better living environments and systems. And so the basis for all of this must be an underpinning that is mechanistic. It is not just imitating nature. It is looking at the underlying mechanisms of how does nature function? What are these principles? And how can we also adapt them to solve a problem in technology and engineering, whether it is the design of a new material or the scale up of the manufacturing of that material. We need to think of the context and that economics, uh, the, the context you can think, for example, about economics and you can think of social circumstances, but we can also think even purely technologically of that uh, nature uh, may grow, for example, a tree over a, a century uh, while we don't have the time for that. And so the time scales are different. So what do we need to change to grow something or to create something at shorter time scales? Now, the materials nature has, materials nature has access to are very different from the ones we have. Nature has to deal with a different, um, with, with locality of uh, resources. Well, maybe we can get them from various resources, right? We can have access to materials that we can use also at higher temperatures, different pressures. And thermodynamics might actually guide us there that that might be a better thing to do. So it is not imitating nature directly. It is not implying to directly use biology, right? So nature-inspired engineering is really learning from these mechanisms and then use them in the context of a real problem, uh, a, a driver for en engineering and uh, technology. So let me give now a number of examples to, to illustrate what I really uh, mean with that. So one that I always like is look back at our tree. A tree is really a chemical reactor. All of the scales are important. The tree can only grow thanks to photosynthesis at the nanoscale, the photosynthetic complexes that make it possible to sequester the carbon dioxide and to turn it into oxygen and into the biomass that makes the tree grow. But that is only possible if water is accessed, if there are resources that go via the root network through the stem and through the branches, through the leaves. So the hierarchical transport network, the structure at the mesoscale, structure of the leaves, the structure of the tree crown are equally important. And here there's a parallel if you think about catalysis, 
where at the nanoscale it corresponds to the active sites of a catalyst, where molecules are converted into other desirable molecules, and it needs to be done selectively and stably. And this is only possible thanks to a catalyst structure which has a high enough surface area and a good access to these active sites. And so it has a parallel here with catalyst particles, materials, with a pore network that is well structured. And then at the reactor scale, here we see this tree, very different from the reactor, reactors I showed earlier, where you have this crown, crown that is self-similar and branching from the stem to the smallest twigs. And it does this in a way that when the tree grows, the number of levels of branching is changing. The size of the twig doesn't change. The size of the leaves doesn't change. It is the number of levels in this hierarchy, in this fractal, so-called self-similarity, this similarity at multiple scales, that is changing. Okay, and so these are aspects that we could learn from and we could use in chemical engineering. Now, well, I contrast this to other aspects of learning from trees, which may be also having their own functions, but they're very different. This is an example that I show here of biosimilarity, right? This is in the Gardens by the Bay, is a famous park in Singapore. And then you also see inspiration from trees. But the inspiration is more of taking a similar structure. This tree is not functional. It doesn't use the functions of the actual hierarchical structure of the tree. It tries to create something with its own aesthetic. And it's even possible to take drinks on the roof. And you have these walls of tropical plants that are growing along it. And so, yes, there are systems to reuse water and so forth um, to, 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 to be able to drive this park. But it is simply copying nature. It is simply biosimilarity. Now, there's a strong contrast in architecture with this example that is actually much older from Antoni Gaudi, who is true a genius in architecture and in, in, uh, in, in design, and who really took inspiration from nature. He involved the aesthetic of nature, both organic architecture and looking at features of the round shapes in nature and the beauty of nature, but also integrated the intrinsic structure. For example, the fact that in a tree you have this crown, and it has nice and interesting mechanical properties where you can support the big roof of here, the Sagrada Familia, the famous church in, in Barcelona that will, when it's complete, will, when it's complete, be the tallest one. And so there, he doesn't just copy and use natural features in it, but he uses really the mechanistic structure of trees uh, to be able to, to support this giant dome. So this is very forward looking and is true bio inspiration. Now, there are many of these hierarchical structures, and they're very important in manufacturing and in material science, right? If you think, for example, about the structure of bones and tendons, these are also hierarchical structures, and they are hierarchical in a geometric sense of having structures that are important at multiple scales. They're not necessarily fractal here. They are just using different structures, but that leads together with multifunctionality, right? These structures are bound in biology. So, for example, in these tendon, and in these bone, you have organic parts, you have inorganic parts that work synergistically so that the materials are strong enough, but also that they are flexible enough, that there is a good use of materials, that there is easy transport of molecules, because if there is no easy transport, then the cells will die and the structures can't survive and they are scalable. So you see, nature is incredibly intricate and it's important to try though, not copying every element of it in materials design, but to say, what are the aspects? What are the mechanistic aspects in this that we can learn from in the design of new materials and nature-inspired materials? And so one person who understood this in the structure of the bone and to show that it's not directly copying the bone is Gustav Eiffel. And you see this actually in the Eiffel Tower. You can't see it directly, but he was inspired, Eiffel, by the structure of the femur, which is the biggest bone in our body, the thigh bone, right? Where there's a trabecular structure and that trabecular structure, uh, as shown by Kuhlmann and von Meyer uh, in, in the 19th century, um, makes it possible that this bone is very strong, but it is also very light. And it does this by having high porosity, but by having a balancing of forces at multiple scales. And so this is the idea that inspired Eiffel in structuring the Eiffel Tower, where he used a minimum of iron and metal to construct this very tall tower, doing it by using principles of force balancing at multiple scales. And he used it beyond the Eiffel Tower, he used it in many bridges that are still used today, like the bridge in Porto, for example. So when we come closer to here in Britain, in the Industrial Revolution, Fairbairn and Stevenson, who you show here together with that bridge in the background, 
also took ideas from nature and inspiration, not in a direct sense, but took natural inspiration to construct this bridge of which you see this picture here on the right. This is what one could call literally a bridge over troubled water, right? This Britannia Bridge, which was constructed in 1850. And um, this was provided to me by a colleague of me, Asterius Gavridides, who's also in the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering at Chemical Engineering, based on a, a documentary shown on the Britain's greatest bridges. So what happened here is that um, Fairbairn and, and Stevenson were set to construct a bridge over the Menai Strait in Wales, uh, which are very deep and treacherous waters. And they must be able, this bridge, to support the new, the railroads and these very heavy uh, engines and locomotives to actually travel over them. And that's very difficult because if you were to use, uh, at that moment, say stone, or you were to use cast iron, these bridges, they would be too brittle. And so the mechanical properties would be insufficient. And it would also be much too heavy. And that was another challenge. And they solved this by looking at nature. They solved it by looking at grasses and reeds which for the same amount of material as a completely solid material, by having this empty core, they are able to not just be strong, but also flexible in the wind, flexible to vibrations and fluctuations. And it's this idea they used to construct this very tall, long bridge at this time. There was an engineering marvel in 1850 to construct the Britannia Bridge. They used the so-called box girder technology, where, they stri where the genius was that the train is not running over it, but it's running through it. It is hollow. And again, you have some hierarchical structure at the top, where you see that not that they try to save on material, so it's not too strong, not not too too heavy, but at the same time, it is very strong. And they used also wrought iron instead of cast iron, so they used at that moment the newest technology, the newest material. They integrated that. So I really want to emphasize that this is not biomimicry in the narrow sense. This is not biomimetics, which has become extremely maybe overpopularized nowadays. This is not imitating nature. It is learning from nature. This is not a reed, right? Just like the bone is not, uh, <laughs> the Eiffel didn't construct a giant bone. They use principles, integrated also principles of new materials, integrated designs that used mechanistic principles from nature. Go forward to the 21st century. My colleague, Marcos Cruz at the UCL Bartlett, which was a school of architecture in the built environment, was also part of the CNIE with whom I collaborate. So he developed these bioreceptive facades. That's yet another way of looking at nature. And he developed these because he was struck by a lot of the so-called green walls that you see on buildings, which have very good intentions, but on the other hand, often use a lot of resources to be able to sustain them. And so one has to go beyond aesthetics. And so he made something that is beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, using additive manufacturing to make these panels which can be made out of concrete, but are also porous, so that the water can be sustained in this and seeds can germinate and form these nice green walls, but they don't need any maintenance. So you can really overcome the current limitations of existing green walls without the need of mechanical irrigation systems and expensive maintenance. So that's another one way of looking at nature, and one can call this bio-integration. Now, Marcos and I, we have joint PhD students, and um, I'll talk about some of their work. One uh, PhD student is uh, Nina, and another one is Ma uh, Malika, and I will return to her work later. Nina Chotanovic, she is actually looking at concepts from nature that are used in biology through biomineralization, right? And so this can be biologically influenced, induced, or controlled structure. We see them in many structures in nature, right? And it shows some examples here on her slide. The issue with all these materials is that, the, that while uh, proteins and biological structures can help these materials grow, inorganic materials under very mild conditions, the process is very, very slow. Right, So it can take a really long time to grow these structures. So while there's a lot to be learned from this, and we see this, for example, in the pioneering work by, by Steve Mann, for example, uh, who's done, who's written a book also on the subject, you can make fantastic, beautiful and useful structures. But often when we want to make larger structures, say for the built environment, we have a challenge of doing this in bulk and doing this at timescales that uh, without proper acceleration of this process. So we must think about mechanisms. So one thing that she is doing is looking at how to make coatings of thin layers. So to make, for example, iridescent coatings or luminous veneers, right? But make these functional, not just purely aesthetic. And here again, nature is using principles, for example, also uh, uh, optical materials where the colors are not chemical colors, but they are made by, say, colloidal crystal structures. I mean, many of our listeners 
uh, will be familiar with these. And so this is one example here uh, from the work of Uli Steiner and Stefan Gould and a colleague in my uh, department now, where they're learning from, from nature and make this artificial nature and learning from these uh, colloidal crystals you see also in wings, uh, so that you can make these uh, thin structures. And so Nina is also looking at how you can actually grow and create structures. Uh, so by being both inspired by nature and integrating nature. So let's go back now to our concept of nature-inspired engineering. So not just chemical engineering. How do we now make this step, right? So I've talked about a number of ways to get inspired by nature, but the key is, I hope to have illustrated this mechanistic understanding, not imitating out of context, but still I haven't shown truly how. I can show a number of examples like this, but the issue is every time you see a different example, you say, aha, somebody thought of this, this is bright, wish I had thought of that as well. But how do you then have a methodology so you can apply it more generally for innovation and for design? And that's what we try to do in the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering. And that's what we got the funding for at the time of this Grand Challenges meeting. I um, discussed at the beginning of my talk between the academies in 2013 and then was renewed in 2019. So what we have been trying to do is to develop a new methodology. Now we call Nature Inspired Solutions for Engineering. This ties in as well as the most recent here knowledge transfer network where we make a link between academia and industry uh, um, about nature inspired solutions. So there's a KTN now in nature inspired solution. I will encourage you uh, to tune into this and come to some of these sessions and webinars and so forth that we're holding on this. So what we're trying to do here in the CNIE is develop a methodology for nature inspired solutions for engineering. So how do we do this? So in general, I think besides the aesthetics and the beauty of nature's I think there are two general scientific ways to look at nature and inspire scientific investigation. The first way is to look at remarkable, unique features, the ones that are concrete. And often these are the territory of biology. An example is this tardigrade. It's a microscopic organism that is able to survive, you know, in deep in the oceans, on the top of, of mountains, even in space for a while. You can put it in liquid nitrogen and it will survive uh, you know, for, for decades, you can uh, um, uh, remove it from the liquid nitrogen and it will start to reproduce. So there is enormous lot to be learned in terms of material design, about mechanisms behind it and about intricate biology. It is very rare, there are concrete properties, and it is exceptional. Then there's a complementary view of looking at nature and to inspire investigation. That is the one of physics. And physics is often concerned about looking at universal features. It's about looking at the common, it's about ubiquitous, it's about abstraction. So you see, for example, the structures you see in the sand, on dunes or beaches or the outer cumulus clouds. And the physicists will say, well, there are similar features. These are regular patterns. So we try to see what are the underlying equations to describe this. And indeed, there are similar underlying nonlinear physics of forming these structures by energy inputs and energy dissipation that drives them. And that helps to advance our view on nature. You can draw this even if you think about gravitation, electromagnetism, and so forth. It's pulling together a lot of phenomena by being abstracting things and deriving also equations to describe them. An example I like a lot um, is the more from um, you know the end of the 20th century. It was uh, Benoit Mendel wrote in his Fractal Geometry of Nature, who discovered that there is a common symmetry in a lot of structures you see in nature, from the structure of the lungs to trees to the vascular network, for example, in this liver where you also, where in each of these structures, you have a similarity under various degrees of magnification. This is called self-similarity, and it goes much further than that, which I won't discuss here, um, in other types of internal symmetries, but which all go back to similar details at multiple scales. So this is very important, because when you discover an underlying symmetry in nature, you get some clues, and you can start asking the question, why is this so? And that's what I'm concerned with, why is this so? And this is what's going to drive one of the themes we do in the center and one of the mechanisms which I'll talk about is the hierarchical transport networks. Okay, and so we see them again, I look at the garden and these are some ferns in our garden and uh, this is a, a, a climbing hydrangea. These are fractal plants. You see the similarity um, in the, I counted it on the, the hydrangea, there are six levels of self-similarity in this. Uh, you see it in many vegetables. So these are, for example, broccoli, romanescu, broccoloni and, uh, um, and a cauliflower where you have this multiplicity of scales, the similar structure at multiple scales. It's both beautiful, but functional, right? So when we go then to this methodology for nature-inspired chemical engineering and nature-inspired solutions for engineering, 
What we want it to be is to be practical, to solve real engineering problems, to be an enabler for innovation. But also we require, in my view, different themes. And uh, we identify this as themes around universal principles that tie into particular mechanisms underpinning um, desired properties in nature, such as these hierarchical transport networks you see in trees and lungs and that are ubiquitous. Okay, so that is indeed our first mechanism and there are many other ones. And so we are going to focus on three or four in my talk today. So the first one is these hierarchical transport networks I, I mentioned a few times. A second one is the one of force balancing, which I also mentioned in mechanical forces, which you saw in the bone, or in the tendons, or in, in um, uh, um, you know, you, you can see it in trees and so forth. But you also see it at the nanoscale, and there the forces are different. For example, in a chaperone, you see a computer-generated image on the left. It's a complex of proteins that is nanoscopic. And in that cavity in the middle, it can help to fold other proteins, right? And so these pro proteins get folded in a particular structure, enzymes can get folded, and in this way become functional. And if this folding is not uh, proper, then uh, the, the enzyme will not be functional. And so this is driven not by steric confinement, but by a subtle balancing of forces that involves electrostatics as well. The same happens in aquaporins and cell membranes, where water is channeled in and out of cells at incredible rates, but it also repels salt. So basically there are water desalination membranes. And this is driven not just by the size of these, these channels, which are can be uh, one nanometer, or, or, or and, and so channel through single um, water molecules, one at the side and pull each other through, but also because of um, polarization effects and electrostatics. So it's a very subtle balancing of force, and there's a lot to be learned of these nano confinement effects. And that's really important in material design as well. A third one has to do with the dimension of time, and I'll say very little, if nothing, in my talk uh, today about this, although it's an, a fascinating field. It is how do patterns arise, phenomena that occur far from equilibrium, and uh, I've discussed two already uh, uh, today. And so there's a lot to be learned from how this works to use the power of dynamics to structure systems, right? I mean, in my field of chemical engineering, uh, often this is an afterthought. One thinks first about the design of the reactor and then introduce dynamics and then control mechanism. And then we look at the system as a whole. And this in fact brings us to the fourth theme, which is looking at ecosystems at networks, at graphs, and modularity. What is the underlying system? And so it's, it's, there's a lot to be learned, say, of how rainforests could work, cloud forests, but also you know, genomic networks, metabolics, and so forth, or how viruses are spread, as we, we unfortunately see today. What is to be learned from these ecosystems? How can we learn from that to build more resilient uh, material systems? Okay, And so that's the nature of our progression award that we recently received to continue uh, the, the CNIE. And so what I've just said, basically, is that you have all these mechanisms, but there needs to be also a systematism, systematism, a systematic approach that is stepwise, that is not just ad hoc, that isn't just applying to a single example. And so what we're doing is looking at nature as a source of inspiration to drive a solution, an application, right? We're interested in a particular application, so the arrow also goes back from the application to seeing, can we draw lessons from nature? But we don't go directly from left to right or from right to left, we must pass several stages. And that's typical in product and process design. It is basically conceptualizing the underlying principles in nature, deriving a concept like the hierarchical transport network, deriving then a design that is a design to solve a problem, such as the scalability of a chemical reactor or a process uh, to, to make certain uh, nanomaterials. Okay, So you need to derive a design based on that concept. And then based on that, to start building experimental realization, which are prototypes. They may be assisted by experimentation and by computation. And often there is some iteration in that to drive that application. So this is an approach which is systematic, right? A set-wise design approach. And so in all this, we think about the context of applications to be effective and to adapt to differences between the natural environment and technical application. And to be robust, we can incorporate new insights, like new manufacturing methods, new techniques, new ways, new materials, and so forth. And in this way, by using this approach, we believe this approach is very versatile. So it promotes lateral thinking, where you can find a solution to design in this way. By using this approach, we believe this approach is very versatile. So it promotes lateral thinking, where you can find a solution to design a new hierarchical catalyst, but then apply it in fuel cells and apply it, in, say, in new dental materials. And that's the type of thing we do in our center in collaboration. 
networks. Okay, so I'll show a few examples of this. So first one is in these hierarchical transport networks. So and we'll, I will go qu quite quickly over some examples and go a little bit more in detail in some others. So first one, in reactor engineering, the problem is going from this active site at the nanoscale to the macro scale that may be meters in size. So you have many orders of magnitude in between. And the trouble is that going from the, you know, the test tube, if you wish, and the, the, or the batch scale at small scale to these bigger continuous reactors, you have a problem because you may have transport issues and maldistribution. And that's where the idea of the tree comes in, these multiple scales, which I illustrated earlier. So when we look at the macro scale, the scale of the reactor, a first idea we got, and this is an, my first invention, uh, basically based on this nature's fire engineering approach many years ago, two decades ago already, is drawing inspiration from the trees and the lungs to design a fractal injector that uses the concept of the branching architecture, uh, but not just the branching, a fractal branching, a self-similar branching, and one which keeps the smallest scale constant. So when you go from a small vessel to a large vessel, you just change the number of generations. You don't just make the whole structure larger. And in this way, you have the advantage of when you have a fluid that you distribute through that stem, through this pipe in the center, and it gets distributed through that fractal distributing system, that the distance from the inlet to each of the outlets, these blue tubes at the end, is the same. And so you have a very uniform distribution to the outlet, just like you see in the lung, like you see in the trees, and then you have a very uniform distribution and a possibility of contact with the contents of the reactor, which you see in the lower left corner. So for example, in a fluid as bed, as you see there illustrated, you can have a primary flow going through the bottom, goes through a distributor plate and puts particles into motion. And the gas puts these particles into motion and contacts with them to react them or to um, catalyze a reaction or to dry or coat, okay? And so typically, the bubbles that are formed in there, they become very large and they start coalescing and growing. And so it is quite difficult to scale these systems up. All right. And so you see these kind of flame like bubbles when you look through. Now, when you use this fractal injector to have some of the gas going through, look what happens. So these gas bubbles, they become much smaller. They're much more uniform because the gas is immediately, intimately within the vessel contact with the solid. So when you apply this, you have a much better contact. And so you have much more efficient reactors. And so what I've done now is to go through this approach. We take inspiration from nature, not just imitating the lung or the tree immediately, but deriving the concept, the concept of the fractal architecture, but also the concept of scaling and keeping that smallest scale constant so that you can do studies at a small scale with a small distributor and then just change the number of generations when you scale up to a large one. So you have to build prototypes, which we could do. Years ago, we had to do this with, uh, we did this with plastic tubes and then with steel tubes and you weld them together. It's quite difficult. Um, and when we came with this idea at that moment, uh, you know, industrial partners might think this is, this is too complicated to implement. But what can we do now? We can use 3D printing methods. We can use laser sintering in metals. We can use additive manufacturing methods to very quickly generate these structures. So as both computationally assisted design, understanding multi-phase flow and materials manufacturing methods have evolved, we can move closer to real applications. So what I show you in the experimental re uh, realization can lead to results which you see on the right there. That is, if you have more gas going, say, through the injector in a catalytic process, in this case, it's a selective oxidation process, you can make of more of the product you want to make and less in the selective oxidation of, say, CO2, right, which you don't want to make. And so this is very interesting where you can, you're driven by a certain application where you have a problem of selectivity, reaction engineering, and uh, heat transfer, and uh, heat transfer and so forth, there's more to it, and that you can solve by using this nature-inspired approach. So in a systematic design approach, okay? So at the mesoscale, we can do the same thing. The mesoscale, though, you look at this leaf, it looks different from the tree. And so a catalyst pore network inspired by this will also look different. So in porous catalysts that are used in many catalytic processes, there are many, diff there are often diffusion limitations. Molecules can't access those very, these active sites in the narrow pores. And you can also have blockages of pores. And so one needs distribution channels. And so there's been a huge progress in synthesizing, designing new hierarchical materials like zeolite composites with controlled pore structures at multiple scales. But the question is still, what should they be like? And when we turn to trees and leaves, you look at some very large leaves and you see that they start with a fractal architecture, 
But then at a small scale, they turn into something very uniform. And when you look at the, the leaf on the right as a poplar leaf, then you see this very uniform structure in between, where, where the cells are in between. Now, what's interesting is that when you um, look at the processes that are happening, this is completely in parallel with the physics. This is the fact that you change the transport from pressure-driven flow and capillary-driven flow to a diffusion-limited process. And so that's the idea that we used here. So when you then redesign these porous architectures of catalysts, then you can form hierarchical catalysts where you find by computationally assisted design that indeed nature got it right, if you want, uh, where you have these uniform particles with a size that's just like this, that you maximize the efficiency within these small particles, say of a size W, and you have a porosity that just allows the molecules to access to larger channels, uh, um, these uh, small nanoparticles. Okay, so locally you have very high efficiency and you maximize the overall effectiveness. Well, the distribution around these pore sizes is not as important. And so when you start implementing this, it's very uh, interesting that you can use it for, say, reducing NOx emissions. It's an important problem with nitrogen oxides, which come from power plants, a pollutant. Uh, it's well known to use selective catalytic re uh, reduction reactors. So you can have these wash coats on the inside of these monoliths, which you see on the right. But what we changed is to propose a hierarchical design of the catalyst with a controlled porosity. The same catalyst, but using the half the amount of material, so putting in more pores, but of the right sizes, can increase your overall yield. So in this way, you have a much shorter monolith and you can convert your pollutants to not just pure nitrogen, and you can do this much more effectively. And very recently, experiments were carried out because this was computationally in collaboration with the University of Leipzig, which demonstrated just that, the same order, so that you can have a 200% increase in overall catalytic activity and removal of nitrogen oxide by hierarchically structuring this catalyst in this way, right? So I'm not going to show, show uh, other examples. I'm just going to quickly go through these, that you have these hierarchical structured zeolites, many architectures. The same principles can be used. And as you often know, the material scientist amongst you, you can often, by using proper chemistries and knowledges of material science, you can sometimes make an entire zoo of different hierarchically structured functional materials such as these zeolithic materials called SAPO, silicon, aluminum, phosphate, just by using different modifiers. But then the question is again often, which material is the best, right? And they are beautiful. You can make these uh, uh, materials that look a bit like uh, um, a desert rose, or they look more like cauliflowers and so forth, and you can give them all fancy names. But the question is, which one is best? And so what we've shown in collaboration with colleagues in Shanghai in the East China University Science of Technology is that when you take a process like hydroisomerization of normal heptane, which is a normal alkane, you want to convert this into isoalkanes, branched molecules. Those have a higher octane number, which is useful for gasoline. You want to maximize the process. And that's a big challenge, actually, in industry. Okay, And so we have looked at this catalyst that I showed you just before, and we have demonstrated that the capture of this molecule and to convert it efficiently and effectively in the desired iso-branched molecules without being broken down. So if the catalyst is not properly structured, the molecules would be broken down to small pieces, light molecules, it's called cracking, and to make undesired molecules. And that is because molecules linger too much within the pores and they can't move out quickly enough. So this lingering leads to advanced reactions which you don't want. And that's shown on the figure underneath there. That is that if your temperature is very low, the reactions are very sluggish, not much is happening. The temperature is high, everything goes quick, everything goes quickly, but it goes too quickly. The molecules can't follow and you have diffusion limitations. So depending on the hierarchy of the materials, you have these different curves with a different maximum. And the cusp, the top, the apex is just at the point where you are between reaction controlling and diffusion controlling. Very similar to what you see in these natural systems. And so using these principles, you can see that the nature inspired structure where you hierarchically structure this material can lead to one where you have a much higher efficiency to leave, in this case, to this isomer, the required molecule, and not to uh, undesired size products. Okay. And as I said, I'm going to jump here completely because the nature inspired solutions for engineering methods allows you to take a lateral approach to apply these same principles you see in catalysis to completely different fields. And so in the group, had a former postdoc, Niall Kent, who is now also a medical doc doctor, and in fact is working now uh, in front line in NHS and was in the, the ICUs. And what we came up with 
was the dental bone graft substitution materials. And so this innovation came about because Niall had a background in uh, materials related to dental materials. And so he would take inspiration from the bone, just like you saw uh, earlier. And so um, the main inorganic material in the bone is the hydroxyapatite, right? And so the problem is when you lose a tooth, you have a cavity and you can't immediately put in a bone graft. So you need a bone graft substitute material to be able to fix them with an artificial tooth, right? To put a dental implant in there. And so often this is, of course, a it's a painful process and it's very slow. And so what we invented is using the same principles, is using, um, uh, is uh, inventing a material we call iro, we call irograft, which is irogel based and has a very high osseo integration and rapid bioactivity. So what happens is that thanks to this hierarchical structure, the material can more easily integrate with the bone. You have very easy transport. You can have vasculature in it and it can grow back much more quickly than all the materials that are there. In fact, also replacement of uh, bovine bone, which many cultures wouldn't want to use. So it can create a new opportunity, in fact, as well. And so Irograph got a lot of prizes. Uh, actually, the first Launchpad Award uh, was won by, by Niall for that, by Royal Academy of Engineering. Also, last year, the Enterprise and Innovation Early Career Award. This is a picture with the Provost and the Vice Provost of Enterprise. And involves also engagement of other former PhD students in the group, like Silo Meoto, who worked in the group. So people work very much in collaboration. And where this has been taken further, where now we are licensing this, we have been patenting these materials. Uh, they could also be used for toothpaste. And so we are looking into, uh, we are in a process with UCL Business to, to license this. So what this example demonstrates is an opportunity to translate by use, looking at mechanisms, by looking at principles. Right. And then to, if you solve this problem, say for hierarchical catalyst, which has taken us a long time to get there, it is actually much easier then to start translating the same principles for another application, say in these dental materials. And that's why I hope the example I illustrate here can be useful for you in your own research because it is much broader. Right. So in PM fuel cells, for example, we use this as well. A fuel cell is a reactor, in fact, to turn say a fuel like hydrogen in electrical energy and to bypass the Carnot efficiency, uh, which is very low, uh, especially at low temperatures. And so the catalyst though in fuel cells are very expensive, are very expensive, often in PM fuel cells, platinum based, and there are a lot of mass transport limitations. And also the water that is formed, it's difficult to manage it. And so we have taken the lung as a source of inspiration here on the one level. So you see in the lung, at, at, uh, sorry, at the one level, at the top levels, it is actually pressure-driven flow, and it goes through 14 to 16 levels of self-similar branching. And then the transport is become so slow by pressure-driven flow, it actually goes to diffusion, like the tree to the leaf. Right? And there you have gas exchange in the alveoli with the blood flow around it. And we took the same principles of pressure-driven flow through flow plates in the fuel cell, right? So on the left and the right is flow plates to get the fuel on one side, the hydrogen, the air on the other side, on the cathode side, and then to structure the catalyst using the principles at the alveoli level of diffusion and the transport, where we can draw lessons from what I just showed you in hierarchical porous catalyst. So here the concept we derive from the lung is that you have these flow plates, which are fractal, and we can use rapid, um, uh, we can use 3D printing methods to, to, to print these flow plates and have very uniform distribution over the catalytic layer, where you have a much more uniform distribution of the catalysts. And so now with advances in manufacturing methods, we can print these structures using selective laser sintering in first instance to print these. And important is again, not to mimic nature, not to imitate. If you say, oh, the, the lung has this fractal structure. So we just use a fractal structure. No, it has a fractal structure down to a certain scale. And this scale may not be the same in the lung or in the tree or in this device. The scale is that where the physics change from flow driven to diffusion driven. And so by computational, uh, by, by calculations, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, we can actually um, uh, investigate what is the number of generations we actually require. And this is tied with what we call the Peclet number, where flow and diffusion are just in balance with each other, which when it, the Peclet number is one. And so we printed these flow plates. And so with X-ray microtomography, you can look through these to find defects as well in steel. So you can actually look uh, nicely uh, through them. And so with different generations of these flow plates, what you see on the right is that the current density ramps up tremendously with the number of branching generations. 
So the lines are computations and the points are experiments, but it will taper off, as we see in computations, if the number of generations is too high, because you're not going to beat diffusion. It's going to be too narrow, this channels at the end. An additional problem is that we can't manufacture them down to that scale. At least we can't do this yet. And new manufacturing methods may come up, new material synthesis methods to allow that. And um, what you see here is, again, we use the same approach. We take the inspiration from Lund, but at multiple levels. I talked about the top row, not about the bottom row here, but we take the concept of the fractal scaling, the design, a possible realization, and then we have these results with its increased uh, uh, current density. And so this is the team that show here who worked on this with me. And so at the catalytic level, which I won't talk about here, you can do similar things to maximize the power of a gram of platinum by doing this, which you can improve by an order of magnitude. Now, a challenge here, and this is in every design, is that this may be still too expensive because these flow plates by selective laser centering, which we were able to do in collaboration with Billy Wu from Imperial College, it's still too expensive. It may cost several hundreds of dollars per plate or pounds per plate, right? And so there comes another PhD student in from our group, Sasan, and he used, in collaboration also with the National Physical Laboratory, NPL, we've been using printed circuit boards, okay? And so in this printed circuit boards approach, we just take, we can just um, put plates together and create these fractal structures in this way, extremely cheaply, very, it draws, it uh, reduces the price by a factor of 10 to 100, okay? Because this is much, much cheaper to use printed circuit boards. And you can, again, use X-ray microtomography to demonstrate that they have a beautiful, well-connected structure here. And so this is an example from a paper that has just appeared, it's just online uh, today, um, where you see these, even you can have a fractal structure to go in and a fractal structure to come out if you want. And so you see that new manufacturing methods help to advance this. So while some of these ideas initially seem theoretical and seem to require either heavy computation, which has become available, new manufacturing methods, which gradually become available, you see how you can advance this. This is quite similar um, to, to the ideas in the sense of these examples from architecture and structural engineering I showed at the beginning. The possibility is that you may have an idea, but to implement it, we need the advances of these different disciplines. So here I work also with the group of Dan Brett in the Electrochemical Innovation Lab, in, uh, in UCL chemical engineering. So there's a lot of knowledge about electrochemistry and electrochemical innovation. So it's through these collaborations, we can make that happen, right? And so again, all these scales are important, the macro scale, the meso scale, and something I'm not talking about here, but the nano scale, where you can learn of enzymatic processes to structure the catalyst. And that's really what integrates all these scales, right? But one thing is, again, one shouldn't be too much in love with one's own you know, uh, the, the, the approach is one thing, but also to be careful if you look at structure of lung and say this works well and the structure of the trees, think about the context of the applications. Because if you noted this carefully, you saw that perhaps the experimental data points were still under the theoretical maximum. And that's what we note when we have too many uh, um, levels of hierarchy that you can have a problem that some of the water that is formed, so the hydrogen and the oxygen, electrocatalytically, will form water, and that water needs to be removed. That's what happens in the PM fuel set. It's nice, you only form water. But the problem is the water can condense in these narrow channels. And with neutral radiography, you can actually look through these channels and you can indeed see that water blocks it and the fuel cell can become unstable, okay? And so again, we can use the second principle of force balancing here to learn something from another creature in nature, namely the thorny devil. And the thorny devil is this nice creature you see here that lives in deserts and can walk in, in muddy ponds, and in this way, through capillary flow, channel the water along its a body to its mouth without uh, going down. And so it is passive transport of water through capillary forces, thanks to this geometrical structure on its skin, but also the fact that you have hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts. So learning from that mechanism, we are now looking into designing coatings and new structures for our flow plates to combine these hierarchical structures with the inspiration we get to manage the water in the fuel cells and make them more robust and to have this passive liquid water removal. And this was the work by a former PhD student, Jason Cho. And so you can work by a former PhD student, Jason Cho. And so you can use mechanical milling, for example, to create these patterns, or you can use laser-based approaches to create holes. 
And you can see in this video that in this structure here, this based on graphite plate, you can even spray lots of water and it just mysteriously disappears, but it's true capillary phenomena. And so we can drive this by the structuring of these channels. And so you see Jay-Z that uses fuel cells in combination, in fact, with batteries to drive also a disability vehicles. So you can bring this all the way to real uh, uh, applications. Now, talking again about lateral approaches, another PhD student, also in collaboration with the Bartlett, with architect, is Malika Schmidt, right? So, so she is an architect who, uh, from, from the Bauhaus University, and, uh, and she's now doing a PhD in chemical engineering in my, in my group, and together in collaboration with Marcos Cruz. And so what there she's trying to do is to develop nature-inspired coatings where you draw inspiration from, for example, cicada winds, insect winds, which through their pillar structures, the water is not left on there, but rolls off. And this is through these pillared structures with a, a defined microscopic dimensions and distance between them. Now, also what you see in moth eyes and in the human eye is that because of the cone structure, an inverted cone structure or a, a, a direct cone structure, you can either channel the light or you can absorb light. That's for moths to see in the dark and the human eyes to focus uh, the light. And so we combined these ideas and these concepts in a design to channel water for coatings. And this we realize again to new manufacturing methods, because what you see here in this picture is only millimeters in size. These are individual water droplets lying on these beautiful bottle shaped structures that are able to channel the water through, capture it and channel it through. And so these could be multifunctional, right? And so you see some other pictures of these and these are one also arts prizes in fact, and were displayed also in the Centre Pompidou in Paris, uh, because of, uh, um, I mean, they, they show both the ability of learning from nature, but also uh, the, 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 um, the, the beauty you can make in the structure. I mean, look here, we used this even for Christmas card, where you can have the light uh, through the LED light that gets completely captured through this, okay? So beautiful structures, but also interesting ones. And they have captured not just the imagination of people, but also uh, in a practical sense, we are now working with the uh, German Airspace Center and European Space Agency, because these structures might be interested to be used as coatings to use on the International Space Station, because it costs tens of millions of do dollars to bring water to space, to the space station. And if you want to go to moon bases and Mars bases, we will have to get our water locally or to recycle all the water as much as possible. And not enough of the water gets recycled. And you also need to have good antibacterial properties and you need to get anti-radiation properties. And so these materials are multifunctional as natural materials are. And so we are developing these materials now in collaboration with them to be first tested on parabolic flights and then hopefully uh, on, onwards uh, to be able to capture much more of the water, okay? So these are some examples. I can't um, uh, give uh, too many uh, of them, but I just want to show you how, I mean, Ciro Meoto, you saw her picture before working on the dental materials in her PhD work, she looked at membranes, right? How do you learn from these aquaporins I mentioned before, uh, which are the nanoscale? So this is not even microscale, this is nanoscale. And this is because these channels are um, channeling water through, they pull each other through the water dipole moments, but also by an electrical field. The fact that the center of these channels is positively charged and the outside negatively charged, you have a repulsion of cations. And so you get a possibility of water desalination. So we're implementing this now in artificial membranes, which have a nature-inspired design, and we want to functionalize them. I put a question mark there, because even if we can realize this with some uh, uh, material synthesis methods we have now, this is not scalable yet. And so a lot of work needs to be done to make these concepts and designs scalable. But I hope to have illustrated to you that this can be done. And so it depends on materials, approaches, and the collaboration uh, with chemists. And in fact, um, most recently, uh, Halan Mohammed, PhD student in our group, she's learning um, from kidneys um, and it's together with a former postdoc, Jerome Meng, who is now also an associate professor in, in Doha University in China. And their kidneys, they can filter the water and they do bioseparation. They keep our proteins in um, and they can do this without fouling, without the membrane to be, uh, to be fouled and to become ineffective. And so what can we learn from this? Because fouling of membranes is one of the biggest challenges in membrane usage industrially for bioseparations, water purification. And so we're looking at properties in these kidneys, like in the glomerular concept uh, um, uh, filters, where uh, brushes are important. So there may be 
chemical factors, geometrical factors, but also dynamic factors, like the hydrodynamics in these channels, and trying to implement this in new designs, right? And so it doesn't, the same problem of anti-fouling can take another angle where a former postdoc, Dr. Jenan Lee, he has been looking at looking at cell membranes instead of these kidney membranes. And there again, learning from the materials properties, you can form um, coatings, in this case, based on biological materials, chitosan and polydopamines, which are multifunctional and can repel uh, uh, fouling. Okay, and we've used this for real water, let's say. So for drinking water and wastewater treatment. Okay, so, so, um, finally, so, um, dynamic self organization. Again, I don't have a time to go into uh, details on this, but since I showed this, uh, example of the patterns you have that are similar in dunes, in, on beaches, in clouds, these are all formed to continuous perturbation. You even see them, the patterns on a cup of tea or an espresso cup of solid particles. These are tied to Faraday waves in that case, but there are similar underlying physics. And we implemented this physics in our fluidized bed that I showed you earlier with this fractal injector. But even instead of having an internal, we use dynamics. And by oscillating the gas flow, we see similarly to these ripples in the sand, we turn chaos into order. So by using dynamics, simply oscillating it within a range of frequencies, this is not a, non, a linear wave, this is a nonlinear wave, you can actually turn a chaotic system into a nicely structured system. You can do this in 2D, like in the system you see on the left. You can do this in 2D, like in the system you see on the left, or in a 3D column on the right, where here you see in the column looped from the top, viewed from the top, you see this beautiful, this with, this is slowed down with a high-speed camera. You can see these beautiful square patterns, similar, it's like, call them Belgian waffle patterns, similar you see in gra on granular matter when you vibrate it on a plate. Okay, so it teaches us also a lot about the physics of what's going on and can help us design new types of reactors. So again, this is done with a team of, of people and uh, um, uh, Victor Francia here, for example, is now a, uh, an assistant professor here at Watt in Scotland and Lillian has moved on to TNO in the Netherlands. Um, and Kaicha was a previous PhD student in the group and is going to start a postdoc in Delft. So all these people, um, I mean, they, they um, use creative concepts but go beyond that. Look at the mathematics behind it, the systems behind it. Look at how are the structures formed in nature and then implement it in designs, which you can really practically implement. It's just by using an additional valve, oscillating a gas flow and changing the system into one that becomes structured. So you have dynamic self-organization here. And so you can use this, for example, here, if you just pulsate the gas flow in materials that normally coat together, like pharmaceutical powders that you want to dry, by just oscillating the flows, it becomes much more uniform, right? And so this is an example I won't discuss, um, but it is one where you can learn so much from all these other organisms in nature. This is another level of complexity, but it's both beautiful, and is, but it's also there are lessons to be learned of how these structures become resilient and how functions are associated to that. And computation, whether it is, say, agent-based systems computation, uh, machine learning based uh, systems, they can learn from that to design new approaches, to design new materials, to design new complex systems that have emergent collective behavior. Behavior. If you do agent based systems by just changing the kinetics of how particles that are diffusing around are interacting with each other, you get these three figures you see on the right, completely different geometries, just like you see in bacterial communities, right? So this is a good guide to make adaptive materials and systems. So finally, one could learn from ecosystems, networks, and modularity. And so there are many examples here. And so I don't have a time to discuss them all, but one example here is one from um, cancer immunotherapy I'm working on together with uh, Professor Richard Day from UCL Medicine, who's now also the application lead on healthcare and um, biomedical engineering in the Center for Nature Spied Engineering. And here we're looking at cancer immunotherapy. It is a, a PhD, former PhD student, Matthew Chin. He developed his microfluidic chip with materials in there, um, with a coating that could activate um, uh, T cells. So this is a problem in cancer immunotherapy where it is extremely promising. It's gone up in the last decade or even less, right, to, as an approach to, um, uh, to get, uh, to find solutions, hopefully, and better treatments to malignant cancers. Now, the problem is that these treatments are extremely expensive. And they're not always reliable. They may be different from one individual to another and one system to another. 
And so what Matthew's vision is not just looking at the materials, materials properties, but also looking at principles from process intensification to make these microfluidic chips hierarchical to actually have cells go through this, gotten from the body of a patient and through the, and through the coatings, which we developed in such a way that these T cells become adoptive T cells and could go back into the body. But the systems approach, but he's using a systems approach at work. So it's a level, an additional level to say, well, um, uh, in nature, you get an evolution, not just based on genetics, but also based on environment, right? So you get an environment, cells behave in completely different ways. This is known also in the ways that stem cells can evolve. They can move to completely different cells based on mechanobiology, a different mechanical environment, different um, a stiffness, for example, of the environment. The geometry plays a role. And so we try to use those type of cues to control the cells, but then have these chips, which may be in contact with other chips that are used in a cloud-based approach, um, so that you can have information from one patient to another and from different patients, different hospitals. And so this may lead, hopefully, this is the grand vision, um, to may lead to much cheaper treatments. And so this involves all the principles I've shown today, hierarchical transport networks, confinement effects, in fact, the cell organization principles, but also control and systems approaches. And so we recently came out with a paper in Trends in Biotechnology, which you can read on this approach. So I will uh, finish here and, uh, and say I've tried to give you an overview, a broad overview of what nature's biochemical engine is. It is not biomimicry, it is not imitating nature, it's thinking about how nature functions and using mechanisms while also thinking of the context of applications. In addition, there is a certain methodology where it is a nature spike solution for engineering methodology to go from nature to a concept, to a design, and to a realization. And that advances thanks to new materials, new computational designs, new designs, new insights, and so forth. So it can integrate that to be able to evolve, right? And so I've shown you a few examples uh, today uh, to make this happen. So normally I work at UCL, and normally when I go to work, uh, I'm not sitting at home as I am today, and as most of you, I believe. Um, we, I passed the building where, um, uh, you know, on the site where Charles Darwin used to live. And of course, with Darwin's uh, origin of species, he pointed out that through evolution, you may have optimal properties that evolve. However, we still, still take a cautious approach to this and say that the design of sustainable solutions may indeed learn from this evolving approach by learning from mechanisms and fundamentals. But we need to think also about the context. And the context may be very different. The goals of nature may not be the same of the ones we have. The, the, the context of society is also different. And so we need to think about that as well when we think of application. And we shouldn't keep, we shouldn't also forget to also look and marvel at nature, right? This is in better times two years ago, and I hope we get back to such times where in Costa Rica I could marvel and those turtles coming and laying their eggs um, uh, just a week before the, the moon is full and where they, um, uh, they, they, they just so organize. And it is just a remarkable phenomenon. And there's a lot to be learned from how this happens and keep marveling at this, but also trying to enable the science. And obviously all I showed here to you today was possible thanks to the amazing group I had, the Nature Spied Chemical Engineering Group as part of the Center for Nature Spied Engineering and the many collaborators. This was last summer in our away day at the London uh, Wetland Centers. And of course, it is also possible thanks to our many industrial partners and uh, that, have, that are supporting us for research uh, and that supporting us in, in this engagement. Uh, and as you see, they come from a variety of industries and from various sizes. And it is that type of dialogue that, that helps us to advance, to think about the real applications, together with, of course, the, the support we have from the EPSRC and UCL.